Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CRE PN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jade Aaron Gross. This is the podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today's interview is sponsored by Building Insurance and Risk. When you invest in real estate, it pays to work with a real estate if, real estate investor protection specialist to protect yourself and your investment from catastrophic loss. The experts at Building Insurance and Risk focus on real estate investor protection. They provide you with multiple insurance coverage offers and a side-by-side -side coverage comparison. To learn more, go to buildinginsurancerisk.com. Today, my guest is Stuart Heath. Stuart is the founder and CEO of Harvard Grace Capital, a private equity real estate investment firm that helps people build wealth faster through hands-off real estate investing that generates passive income, reduces risk, and maximizes tax efficiencies. And in just a minute, we're going to speak with Stuart about the hidden mistakes to avoid and key criteria to look for when evaluating potential passive property investing opportunities. But first, a quick reminder, if you like our show, CREPN Radio, there are a couple things you can do to help us out. You can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, we encourage you to leave a comment. We'd love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you want to see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. You can find us on YouTube at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And while you're there, please subscribe. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Stuart Heath. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. Appreciate it. Well, I'm looking forward to our conversation, but uh, before we get started, if you could take just a minute to uh, share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, I, I have uh, lived my entire life uh, in, in Tennessee, Alabama area. Uh, I, I am a certified public accountant, graduated from Auburn University uh, a long, long time ago. Uh, and uh, I still practice as a CPA, but my main focus is on sponsoring cash flow and real estate investments and syndicating those to investors uh, where that fits their portfolio needs. Got it. And so you are based in Tennessee, right? I am. Yeah. And is that primarily the uh, the area that you invest in or, or do you uh, get further out or? Uh, it is primarily... Uh, the area that we invest in. And so, and actually it's a little bit more narrow than that. Um, generally the area we invest in is called the Tennessee Valley, uh, more specifically and um, sort of a, almost as a marketing gimmick, we, we say we invest in the 840-565 corridor. And that refers to two interstate connectors. One of them, 840 is south of Nashville and 565 runs through Northern Alabama, which includes Huntsville. And so we like to invest in between those two interstates uh, in, in some um, suburb uh, towns, uh, even some smaller towns that are impacted. But the real heartbeat of that geographic area uh, is not so much Nashville, as you might think, uh, which obviously is a big regional influence, but Huntsville, Alabama is growing and growing and growing uh, and is just and it's just creating lots and lots of real estate opportunity. And I like to tell investors that it reminds me of Nashville about 30 years ago. And I don't, I don't want to really miss the, miss the train this time. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I've, I've heard uh, about Huntsville. I think um, mostly, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it not like a, a NASA um base there is there i mean I, yeah, there it a, was um you know most people space. Think nasa is is based down in florida and in houston but uh a great deal of the um the research and development for nasa since its beginning it has been in huntsville it's been quiet it's been a um uh, it's it's been a real uh, defense contracting research hub so awful lot of rocket scientists living there who really can't talk about what they do uh, for a living and but that all changed in 2008 uh, when the uh, Congressional Base Realignment Commission 
relocated three army commands to the Redstone Arsenal, which is the army facility in the middle of Huntsville. Uh, and uh, it, that, that brought uh, a bunch of new generals and all the commands that come with that. Uh, there was also uh, a, bit, a new big push in defense spending. Uh, that if you're a defense contractor, you've probably had facilities in uh, Huntsville for a long time, but but now they're increasing their staff as they come out of California or out of other parts of the country, they increase staff there. And simultaneously with the big government push, there's been a, a private industry push. Toyota, who already had a, a plant there, uh, has built a brand new joint venture uh, manufacturing facility with um, Mazda to build some engines. And uh, they've hired, uh, they came in saying they're going to hire 3,000 people and now they're up to 6,000. So uh, Facebook has a big uh, data center here, which employ, employs uh, several people. Uh, and it just keeps going and going and going. There's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of affordable land, a lot of good workforce. Uh, available there. So we've seen this big manufacturing push and, and and all of that creates needs for housing and other commercial real estate needs. Now, that's great. And uh, what is the uh, the size of the MSA there for the, the, the I guess, the Huntsville? And then I guess I just ask, is the, the Tennessee Valley, is it all populated throughout or is it is it kind of like two ends or how? I'm not looking at a map. Yeah, um, so Huntsville is uh, sort of at at this dip uh, in in the Tennessee River, uh, and and it continues to flow towards the Mississippi, obviously. And, and uh, so you've got Huntsville, which is the the big influential city. It's now the largest city in the state of Alabama. Uh, there's a little bit of semantics. The Huntsville MSA is not larger than Birmingham's MSA, but uh, city limits to city limits, Huntsville is larger. Uh, but the Huntsville MSA also includes Athens and Decatur. And the MSA actually includes several Southern Middle Tennessee towns uh, as you cross the border. Uh, like where I live in Fayetteville, Tennessee, you know, we're in the Huntsville MSA. Um, I'm a lot closer to Huntsville than I am Nashville. So there's about 450,000 uh, in that Huntsville MSA, uh, and that might just be the, the northern Alabama uh, population that include perhaps another 75 or 100,000 in that middle Tennessee uh, area uh, where you pick up Fayetteville, Pulaski, when, uh, towns like Winchester, all of, all of whom also have some sort of a uh, distant defense contracting um, uh, employment base in these little towns too so yeah well i mean you, you've uh, mentioned one of the favorite employers of uh, real estate investors as government from a standpoint of a uh, you know stable workforce and and uh you know it's not like the the government's uh, gonna go out of business so that's that's a good thing there um yeah we don't think so anyway yeah fingers crossed on that i guess i should, <laughs> should you know, knock on wood there yeah right. um so what uh, are there any specific asset classes that you uh, focus on? Yeah, we're, we're a little different uh, because we do focus on a geographic area uh, that we know so well. I've been here my entire life. Um, so we've not really limited ourselves to one particular asset class. I think that's an appropriate uh, philosophy um, if you're expanding geographic area, because apartments are pretty much going to run and operate the same and have the same similar issues, whether you're in Kansas City or if you're in L.A. Um, but because we focus geographically, we, we, we have uh, and we invest in all uh, types of commercial real estate, uh, save one. We don't do we're not we haven't really bought into the big um, uh, built for rent communities of single family homes. Um, I have a worry about that's building a bubble in that particular uh, asset class that will probably start showing up maybe five to eight years from now. As in, in my, my worry is that the um, uh, that the institutional buyers who who go in and build five hundred homes. Um, 
you know, they're going to, they're just going to all of a sudden dump them on the market in about 10 years. And, and I think it it could have a damaging impact on that. I might be wrong. They might not do that. Um, but um, yeah, I suspect somewhere around the 10 year mark, which is where most brand new homes start to have things like water heaters and HVAC units and stuff like that. I, I think once the maintenance really kicks into that asset class that, um, there will be a wholesale dumping of those assets uh, on the market. And that might impact pricing. It might not. There might be willing buyers ready to uh, gobble them up and turn them back over for rent. But so we've we've done storage, self-storage. Uh, we've not done industrial yet. Um, haven't found an industrial deal that I like. Uh, we've also not done a, a multifamily yet because we are cash flow buyers. We are not fixers and flippers. Uh, and every multifamily deal that I've found that has already been renovated and is um, stabilized, uh, I think is way too expensive. Uh, so we have not uh, bought that because it, it's, it, you know, if you got to wait a couple of years for the cash flow to, to kick in, uh, that's that's not a deal for us. Uh, we've done some office. We're doing another, um, when I say office, I'm talking about suburban office, which a lot of people classify as retail. I'm sitting in one of our assets uh, here in, in Spring Hill uh, where, um, you know, our tenants are doctors, dentists, mortgage companies, you know, things, uh, things that are consumer facing, uh, but they can't really be um, done remotely. You can't remote your dentist. You can't remote your doctor. You know, he's not coming to see you. Uh, and and mortgage companies, by law, have to have a, a physical office. Even if the, the people are working from home, they have to have an office. So there's lots of uses like that uh, in quote, the office realm uh, that is slightly different than you know glass front retail. So and we're uh, we're under contract on another one in Huntsville, uh, very similar to that, um, right in the heart. Uh, at, technically, it's in Madison, Alabama, which is an upscale community that is surrounded by Huntsville. Gotcha. Um, I was going to ask you, I, I, if I'm, if I'm correct, I believe that uh, Tennessee has uh, no state income tax. Is that? That is correct. Yes. And uh, how's that compared to Alabama? And, and does it, uh, you know, is there an attraction to, to Tennessee over Alabama based on that, or, or has it not been a, an issue? Uh, it's a good question. Uh I have made some money in in past uh, opportunities uh, at state line arbitrage, but uh, state income tax is not one of those that you can, that you can do because if you live in Tennessee and work in Alabama, you're still subject to that state income tax. Uh, there are some things where um, uh, you can do some retail on the Tennessee side if you live in Alabama, so there's some uh, opportunities like that, for instance. Tennessee has a lottery, Alabama does not, and there's a particular property owner I'm aware of uh, at the state line on one of the major highways coming out of Huntsville that's the largest seller of lottery tickets in the entire state of Tennessee because it's 15 minutes away from a massive population of people that don't have a lottery, and it, it's quite the spectacle. So, um, Alabama is seen as very, very, very business friendly. Uh, they do have an individual and a business tax. They are not very onerous. There are lots of exemptions from them. Uh, and they're otherwise wheel tax and um, property taxes are, are generally low. So all in uh, taxes, um, you know, total to total, uh, Tennessee and Alabama might be um, you know, fairly comparable. Uh, uh, with Tennessee getting the edge, uh, with probably Texas and Florida being the, the leaders in sort of the, the state taxation game, as they have been for a long time. Well, and, and uh, I want to say that I I uh, read or saw something here recently talking about uh, three of the top fastest growing states. You mentioned Florida and Texas, but is Tennessee not like number three? I, I think I'd heard that. Uh, depending on who you look at, Tennessee is either in the top 10 or the top five. So I heard okay. our governor at the state of the state address claim that, you know, we were, I think, number three or four, because I haven't seen us that high yet. But I mean, Tennessee's been sort of quiet 
uh, and, and, but but growing very 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 friendly business state, uh, and, and you, you know, um, with, just over my shoulder, General Motors built the Saturn plant back in uh, what, 1987 or 1988. While they don't have Saturn anymore, they still um, uh, build several Chevrolet vehicles there, and that is the campus of the site where they're building their new EV assembly plant and their EV battery plant, uh, and which is gonna bring lots and lots of jobs here to uh, to Spring Hill, as if Spring Hill wasn't thriving already. Uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, t Tennessee's a, a good state. They, they, don't, they don't go crazy um, uh, too far one way or the other. We just, um, uh, I think they just uh, put out reasonable policies, so. One of the reasons we we like the areas we like these suburban rural areas. Yeah, I was talking with somebody else from uh, yesterday. I think it was uh, from Texas, and he was telling me about a slogan they have that was something about like "Welcome to Texas, but please leave your your values out, you know where you came from or something." They were <laughs> they're afraid that yeah. <laughs> what was good was going to change based on the the uh, in migration from uh, all of the, the blue states or whatever. You know, yeah, we have. So, you know, um, we have some of that going on here. We have a lot of people coming in and um, uh, from the Western states uh, and some, and yeah. 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 I'm glad you like it here. You're welcome. But, uh, yeah. you know, there's a reason you like it here. <laughs> right. Right. No, we, also it, like to we also like to remind all the people from Texas that the, there wouldn't be a Texas if there wasn't a Tennessee. So uh, going back to the, um, to the early 1800s when the Tennessee volunteers, which is why we're the volunteer state, they just picked up and went to Texas to, to fight Mexico, you know, even before they were a state. So, Yeah, no, I forgot that a uh, uh, little bit of American history there, but that's, uh, yeah. that does have a, a rich history there. I, I'm trying to think it was Daniel Boone. Was he, was yep. he uh, down there and all that, but uh, that's great. Um, so, talked a little bit about asset classes and um i wanted to ask you a, a little bit about uh, passive versus active uh investing uh when you work with people uh do you, do you focus mostly on on uh you know helping them in in a passive way so they can invest with you or do you also work with people uh to do some active investing it sounds like you are clearly uh actively investing what tell me a little bit about how you, you work with others? Um, well, coming from my CPA background, I meet people where they are. I had a meeting with a group of investors who wanted to have me put together a, you know, basically a private deal just for them on a storage deal that they, they're uh, restaurateurs and they're very, very successful in their restaurant business and they want to expand in, in, in storage uh, and you know, I, I was introduced to them as somebody who's operating storage. And, and so um, that would not be a syndication deal on our part, but uh, they're very sophisticated business people and and, and want to put some money to work in storage. And, and so that would be me meeting them and and I would they would be active investors in, in, at that standpoint. Uh, and I would be a partner with them. But for the most part, um, yeah, I am working with investors uh, on a passive basis, uh, you know, not just by good common sense, but you know, by law, we need to get to know these investors uh, a little bit um, to be able to understand their needs. Uh, in our last raise last fall, uh, you know, there were a couple of investors that we just had to say, I, I don't think you're a good fit for us. Um, yeah, they said they were accredited. Uh, I, I sort of doubted it, and you and it's possible for people to meet the uh, definition of an accredited investor and really not know what they're doing. Um, and, and you know, so we we like for everybody to um, have a good understanding of, of the business. Nobody has to, you know, it's it's totally passive. Once you're an investor, you don't have to make any decisions or guarantee any debt or. Uh, show up and clean any toilets or, or, or anything like that. All of that is handled, but we do like for you to understand the economics uh, of the uh, transaction and the risks involved. 
So um, we have good conversations. Most of our investors, uh, well, as a matter of fact, to date, all of our investors have reinvested with us in latter deals. And we always pick up a, additional investors uh, along the way as well. So we've got a 100% reinvestment rate, which I'm pretty proud of. Uh, in, in all truth, that's some pretty small numbers, but uh, it, it's um, still a good thing to say. Uh, but but we make sure we get to know what their achievements are and that you know the, the investment will be illiquid for a period of time, uh, even though uh, we will start throwing off cash flow in the very first uh, quarter uh, after the deal because that the deal will cash flow from day one because all we do is stabilize properties. Got it. So when you say stabilize properties, um, are you... Are, are you not looking for ways to improve it or is it more about just it's all it's it's a turnkey thing and you you're able to get it at a price where you're able to uh, uh, generate cash flow? Well, um, the latter is key. We do get it at a price where we can generate cash flow. Um, but yes, we're always looking at, at ways to improve because tenants needs to change you know, like this this office building that I'm in right now. Um, you know, my dentist wants to expand. Somebody else wanted to reduce. Um, I had some storage space um, that was just used. It was just extra space um, uh, on one piece that the that the previous seller had used to keep a boat in, uh, and uh, and so you know it's 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 almost like the game where you got to move things around. So I got a small tenant to go up to that space. We we built that out for him. Uh, and and he's happy as a lark in his own little space uh, up there. Uh, and, it, and so that space that was never previously rented. So I have a new income generating space up there. The dentist is happy because he got to expand. And my other tenant is, is happy because he got to reduce. And actually in between the dentist and the other guy, I created a whole nother space uh, that, that's, that's already been leased. So yes, and, and in the whole process, I was able to move everybody up uh, to new longer leases at market rates. So yes, uh, there is always a, a room to improve because a piece of commercial real estate is uh, is a living, living, breathing thing because tenants are living, breathing people and their needs change. Um, I mean, my, my dentist is um, 70 years old and has a 10 year plan. I, I just, you know, uh, he's, he's an amazing dynamo, but, um, and you know, he'll he'll sell that practice to somebody, but he wants to lock in that lease uh, b before he does that. Uh, so um, yes, there are always opportunities to improve, and, and so we're getting a real step up, and we're we're going to beat our pro forma on, on this building in, uh, beginning later this year once all those new rents kick in. And yeah, you know, we spent some money to do that, but uh, we were able to do that without any capital calls, uh, you know, be between reserves we had and the bank who's very happy with us um, you know, and, and, and we'll pay all that off um, over the next three, four years. So Got it. throwing off more cash flow. So. What's a, uh, you, you mentioned that the investors you, you've got have uh, reinvested with you. What's an average hold time for you on your, your investments? Our average hold time is going to be about five years. Uh, but because we are cash flow investors, and this is a little bit counterintuitive to um, a lot of professional real estate investors, you, you, you need to understand the industry of people like myself, you know, we make money um, when you're buying or selling. So, you know, there, there's fees involved and, and profits and stuff. And, and that's great. And I think that's correct for a lot of but I'm also trying to build a recurring cash flow stream for myself because I invest with the investors. Um, but we always tell them it's a it's an average five years. Uh, but actually, um, I try to talk them into holding because uh, you can refinance the property as it goes up in value, and you can take advantage of advantageous rates. You pull the cash out, you give the money back to the investors which might get them you know, uh, made 100% whole plus a pr preferred return. And then, th and then uh, they stay in and just keep getting the cash flow. 
It might be a little bit reduced cash flow because now you got a higher note, but the property continues to grow. Um, and then they've got more money to go invest in another deal with you. And, and, and so you start stacking your cash flowing opportunities and, and you pull that money out of the first one, that's, that's tax free because that's just borrowed money and a capitalism. There was no, there was no income event for that. Uh, and ultimately, one day you're going to sell the property, but um, commercial real estate has a long, long life to it. And as long as you're taking care of it along the way, uh, you're going to extend that life, much like having the maintenance plan on your HVAC. Um, you, 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 you have them come out and do the maintenance, and guess what? You can get a lot longer life out of that HVAC unit than you would by just waiting to uh, fix parts when they break. Yeah, no, it's... Definitely, you're going to pay one way or another, <clears throat> and then it's usually a yeah. lot less expensive to uh, pay pay as you go and maintain it. And, and uh, right. plus, I find the the newer appliances, whatever whatever you're buying, uh, they're built to go just past the warranty. So here, <laughs> I know get something older that's working. <laughs> hang on to it. I've got <clears throat> a 1974 refrigerator that's that was left in the house that we that we live in. And that thing is still running. It's the coldest. It makes the best ice. I mean, it's, I hope it's never going to kind of quit. <laughs> yeah, I don't even like, don't to tempt, like that. tempt fate talking about some of them because it's, I mean, I just, you know, like, you know, nod because some of them, they just, they, they were built to last. I mean, there was no, there was no, um, you know, they, they weren't building them just to, to, uh, go past the warranty back in the day. They, they didn't uh, understand that, that, uh, What's that? Uh, there's a phrase for it. It's something. Um, Planned obsolescence. There you go. Yeah. I don't think they, they did not understand that in the day. That was not a. Not a uh, the marketing uh, team wasn't running the company yet. You know, the manufacturing right, team was. <laughs> right. That was all about your your good name and how your the quality and how yeah. it lasts. But uh, right. Anyway. So let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, mistakes, um, some of the hidden mistakes uh, that, that you see, uh, investors make, uh, and, and potentially ones that, that you've made that, uh, you know, you didn't recognize until they were made. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit about some of the mistakes you've seen. I think most passive investors, um, probably don't pay enough attention to, um, the timing, the intended timing, the stated timing of the investment on the front end, uh, and, and 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 likewise, it's not necessarily the investment's fault, but they're not paying enough attention to the their own cash needs uh, and seeing if it's an appropriate investment for them. So it's not something that they should be that they should go in lightly. I've had investors that I've done. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah you know you know, here, I'll, I'll send you money. And, um, um, and I always make sure I say, all right, you understand what, you, what you're buying. And, and like said, most of these guys are very, very sophisticated, but I think a lot of them don't do a proper planning uh, on the personal side because generally on your real estate investment, your money's going to get locked up for about five years. Uh, whether or not it's a it's an income generating thing, you know, we we like we like cash flows, and so we pay out income, but that's not paying back your original hundred thousand um, dollars that you perhaps have put in. Um, mistakes that I've made on underwriting early on is um, failing to realize that, gee, when you buy the property, uh, the local uh, taxing authorities are going to reset the value of the property uh, and your new your new property taxes are not what the seller was paying it's going to be based on the purchase price and, and so yeah I, I i did that in my first deal and i still kick myself for it because yeah you know, i just say i'm a cpa i knew better um even in some of these um districts um, that that don't raise property taxes very often yet they are going to do it when the property sells i mean that's just that's just low-hanging fruit for them and, and and it's appropriate um and you got to plan on that likewise um your insurance you you're not going to keep a similar insurance premium from what your seller was paying 
uh, besides, I've come across many sellers who were just being kind of dumb at what they were insuring anyway. Um, but your insurance is going to be based on the price you just paid, as you know, as a replacement value uh, and and things of that nature. So you've got to um, got to take those simple things into uh, account. Um, whether or not you think um, it's likely, like uh, to date, every deal we've done has been a 100% full property. You still have to underwrite for the possibility of vacancies. Now you can start that after leases you know expire, but you, you shouldn't just assume 100% that all leases will renew. I had one uh, just last month who've been telling me their their lease renewed um, February 1st. They've been telling me for six months, yeah, I'm going to renew, I'm going to renew. And I was being slow at sending them the lease. Um, but we haggled out the, the price. We had all the details worked out to, before Thanksgiving. Then they informed me on um, January 15th, they were not going to renew. Um, I never liked that tenant anyway, because uh, you know, that wasn't the first time they, hadn't, they had been untruthful with me. But um, uh, so, you know, we had uh, exactly uh, 17 days of vacancy because I, I, I was able to turn that unit around and, and, and rent it that quickly. Um, and, and, but it could have been, it could have been 90 days, could have been six months. You know, commercial doesn't um, uh, turn that fast. We're just blessed to be in a very vibrant area. Um, and, and, and that, and it was, there was a need. I mean, first part of the year, there was a lot of, uh, people looking to, uh, for new office space. So it was good timing on our part. Yeah, 17 days on a vacancy. I'd say sign me up <laughs> if I could get that. That's... Yeah. And I'm I'm curious uh, on a on a commercial turn. Uh, was there any significant work you had to do? No. No. Um, we went in and we, we had renovated that space for that tenant in 2019. Uh, they were very gentle on it. Uh, so we went in and touched up some wall paint and uh, gave it a nice cleaning. Uh, and uh, that was about all there was to it. So we were fortunate in that. Uh, realm. Uh, you see that a lot in, um, in commercial, unless they're just packing people into their office. And, and you know, it's not like when I was managing uh, residential properties where uh, um, even the good tenants would, do so much. I mean, you were repainting the the whole unit every two years and replacing flooring and stuff like that. Uh, it, the um, uh, commercial is a lot less wear and tear. Yeah. No, I I have uh, come to appreciate. Uh, well, it's it's two sides of the same coin, I guess. You know, you have one, uh, at least in the residential, which is mostly where I play. Is the um, you know, if you keep pushing the rents, there is going to be turnover. And the good news, if it's, if it's, you know, only a couple of years, they probably haven't beat the place up too bad. Uh, if you have somebody stays a long time, that's a good thing because you're not having turnover, but usually when they do leave, it's like an encampment and there's usually some, you know, quite a bit of stuff that was left that isn't yours that you've got to, you know, take care of and, and basically a full rehab on a, on a, you know, mostly like a single family property or something like that. So. Right. I, the, the commercial is appealing just from, you know, I've, and I've kind of come to learn this even about uh, talking with some people about like this Airbnb models about how, you know, people, they come and they, they're basically just, they're there and they're kind of on their best behavior. They're not, you know, um, you know, it's not a, a, a kind of wear it out, you know, dogs running around and, you know, kids and peanut butter and jelly and, you know, whatever crayons on the walls and that kind of stuff. It's more, um, uh, kind of come get your work done, the professional kind of turn the lights off, go home uh, kind of thing. Uh, so that's, that's why I have gravitated to commercial. Uh, I've, I've done residential personally. I've done it professionally. Um, and because at Harvard Grace, we manage all of our own properties, uh, which I'm actively involved in. And we do that because you know, it's probably a whole other show, but we, we think the, uh, the model for property management, third party property is kind of broken. So we do that ourselves to ensure that we can deliver uh, the pro forma that we've sold to investors. Um, but 
I, I don't like dealing with with residents. Uh, they, they're not business minded people. Um, you, you know, it, it's it, it's not personal. You know, when you go to collect rent from somebody who's behind, it, it's uh, at their apartment. It's very personal, and they get emotional. And and, um, and even though you can be behave you can you, you you can do it well and and you can treat people right uh, at the end of the day you know they got to pay or get out uh, it's um uh, the, to me the laws are actually more in favor of, of commercial uh, landlords than they are residential landlords and um, uh, anyway I, it's just so it's called a lifestyle thing i like dealing with professional people self storage is sort of the same way people don't live there well they're not supposed to live there but um but, uh, you know, the laws are such, uh, hey, pay or I'm locking you out, <laughs> you know, and, and it's it's very straightforward. Uh, hey, dude, it ain't personal, um, you, you know, but it's 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 pay to stay, you know, it's that kind of stuff. And, and I wish residential could be more like that. But, you know, when you're dealing with people's residences, um, you know, the laws are probably correctly in favor of the tenant, primarily because for thousands of years there have been bad landlords so you know in mistreating people so yeah no i think the most of the laws that we have uh came from like you said uh, a need um there was some abuse somewhere that that uh, sure. occurred and and uh you know unfortunately a lot of times it's it's the rare exception that is that uh but the, then the law basically says we're not going to tolerate that anymore and uh you know, for the most most people that were operating all along, you know, within the the uh, the realm of reasonable, uh, it it's not really a big deal for them. But um, still, like you said, there are, there's definitely um, a longer list of laws that affect residential tenants and landlords as opposed to the uh, the commercial uh, leases yeah. there. So, got that. Um, hey, Stuart, if we could, I'd like to uh, shift gears here for a second. Uh, by day, I'm an insurance broker, and uh, as such, I work with my clients to assess risk and determine what to do with the risk. And uh, there's three strategies we typically consider. Uh, we first look to see if there's a way we can avoid the risk. When that's not an option, we look to uh, see if there's a way we can minimize the risk. And uh, if we cannot avoid nor minimize the risk, then we look to see if there's a way we can transfer the risk. And uh, that's what an insurance policy is. It's a risk transfer vehicle. And uh, as such, I like to ask my guests if they can look at their own situation. Uh, could be uh, the market, interest rates, uh, political, your, your tenants, investors, however you would like to frame the question and identify what you consider to be the biggest risk. And uh, again, for clarification, while I am an insurance broker, I am not necessarily looking for a, an insurance related answer. And uh, so if you're willing, I'd like to ask you, Stuart Heath, what is the biggest risk? Um, I am willing, so, and I will dive into this pool. I think it's a, it's a brilliant question. Um, uh, to me, the biggest risk, um, is tenant selection. Uh, it's not an insurable risk. You know, I do live in um, uh, Tornado Alley. So, you know, severe weather can be a risk, but you can insure around that. Um, but the biggest risk is essentially the income from the property and the income from the property comes from uh, tenants. And, and it is a professional, I think it's a professional expertise that is developed to be able to underwrite a new tenant for a lease. Uh, it's not just the first person that called and say, and, and is willing to pay you the deposit. And I use that example because I've made that mistake before. Um, it, but if you will take, um, you know, an hour's worth of due diligence, uh, either residentially or even uh, commercially, uh, and uh, check into them, get third-party reports, uh, and do reasonable and customary means of, of verifying what what 
the tenant is telling you, uh, and you know, then then you will most of the time select a proper tenant. If you don't do that homework, your property will have income problems. And so what is a bad tenant? Is, well, number one is a bad tenant that doesn't pay. That, that's one. But part and parcel with that uh, is people who don't pay usually bring other kinds of people to your property whether it be multifamily, whether it be to your commercial office, your storage space, whatever. I have seen this over and over and over again, uh, which actually begins to uh, make other tenants feel uncomfortable. Uh, and, and so now your problem is a lot worse than just the one guy who's not paying. Uh, and, and it was also easily headed off by doing some basic due diligence on the front end. That's the biggest risk I have in what we do. There are obviously other kinds of risks, slip and fall risks, and we get sued by somebody uh, whose coffee was too hot or um, whatnot. And, and uh, again, that's insurable risk. Uh, we carry general liability as well as property coverage. And, and on most of our properties, we'll, uh, it, like uh, we also get you know business interruption insurance or uh, you know, like if a tornado takes out a line of our storage buildings, well, you know, we're, um, we're not only going to get repaid to have that rebuilt, but uh, we will get income that we're missing uh, from those units that, that the tenants can't use. Uh, so, but the, the, the biggest risk is the one that's not insurable. And that to me comes down to tenant selection. That is so appropriate uh, for myself and I'm sure all the listeners to know that, uh, you know, selecting the tenant and I, I know on commercial, it's it's a lot more of a, um, I mean, you have the ability to to credit check, or not credit check, but just to really establish, uh, you know, how credit worthy they are. Um, but in fact, if I understand right, I mean, a lot of the, the commercial real estate is basically valued on <clears throat> the, um, you know, the the strength of your your tenants. You know, yep. if you've got, if you've got a bunch of, you uh, uh, people that uh, have only been there for a little while and they they rarely pay or, you know, they don't have a whole lot of credit, that's probably a tougher sell than if you've got, you know, name brands or, or established businesses with with uh, significant credit uh, history to to uh, yeah. sell. So but just in this building, I have a public company tenant. Um, and you know, they're always fun to negotiate leases with because they never want to pay a security deposit. Uh, and it's, well, look at us, you know, uh, anyway, we usually arm wrestle over that. But I've got everything from the public company to the single CPA, who is a great guy, has been a great tenant, but there's no backup there. So that's essentially a lease to a person in that situation. Great tenant, love, glad they're here. Um, but you know, it's not exactly triple A credit, uh, like, you know, in, in some commercial properties where you have a great big company uh, that leases an entire building. Well, now that building is valued entirely on the credit uh, and the terms of that lease. And so, yeah, you're right. But, wow. No, this is, this is good stuff. And uh, I appreciate you, uh, you uh, sharing with us the, the, uh, Kind of the mistakes and and uh you know what your experience has been and and uh how we can avoid them hey Stuart, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you uh the best place to get information on me and connect with us is harvardgracecapital.com you can find my calendly link there if you'd like to book some time with me you can look at our resources there we have lots of resources available for free you can join our mailing list there and just follow what we're doing uh, and let me, I always say, I, I encourage people to use my Calendly link. I do love talking with people about real estate, whether you inv ever invest with me or not, or you just want to call me stupid. That's okay. I still enjoy talking to you. So. That's great. Well, Stuart, I cannot say thanks enough for uh, taking the time to talk today. I've uh, enjoyed it. I uh, learned a lot and I look forward to doing it again soon. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you having me. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 
Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.